Daniel, uh, thank you so much for coming to Shelling Point. I invited Daniel Schmachtenberger to come here to talk about existential risk and uh, catastrophic, catastrophic risks to civilization. Um, and he's one of the most lucid thinkers that I've ever listened to on the topic. And I'm so excited for this conversation and what the Web3 community can learn from the work that you've done. So thank you for joining us, Daniel. Hey, man, I'm happy to be here. Can you guys hear us all right? Is AV adjustable? Uh, maybe we could be closer into the microphone or the AV can boost Daniel's mic. All right. Is that better? All yes. right. So let's start here. Daniel, what is the meta crisis and what does that assessment offer in terms of design considerations for our work in regenerative crypto economics? Yeah, I'm going to ask you guys to forgive me. I'm just going to kind of talk to Kevin because it's easier to deal with the noise that way. Um, yeah, so the meta crisis is a way of thinking about all of the interconnected catastrophic and existential risks that the world faces right now. Not just the fact they're interconnected, but that they have similar drivers. And that if we mm -hmm. are to address them, we have to not just address them all individually, but actually look at what the generator functions of them are. Mm -hmm. So we know that we have... Uh, existential risk many different ways to artificial intelligence, whether we're talking about paperclip maximizing issues or right. AI drone warfare or simply like AI optimization of an extractive economy. Mm -hmm. We know the same thing when it comes to um, biotech, CRISPR, synthetic bio, existential right. risks, when it comes to cyber attacks on infrastructure and drone attacks on infrastructure, the whole category of exponential tech creates pretty radical fragilities in the world. Mm -hmm. And um, obviously in addition to not just climate change, but all of the planetary boundary issues that cumulative industrial tech has created. Right. So you can kind of think about catastrophic risk in two major categories, which is the mm -hmm. cumulative effects of industrial tech that have linear supply chains, mm -hmm. linear materials economy, uh, hitting limits of growth. And so on right. the extraction of finite resource side and then on the, uh, you know, pollution side. So obviously on the pollution side of the energy economy, you have climate change. On the right. other side, you have actually an issue that's probably going to hit us even sooner, which is a diminishing return on uh, energy returns on hydrocarbons, right. with hydrocarbons still being pretty difficult to replace in terms of energy and being pegged to the dollar or being pegged to like global GDP and global energy being nearly one for one pegged, right. and an exponential embedded growth obligation on currency that means you have an exponential need to grow the total amount of energy in the system while having a diminishing return on energy availability. Mm -hmm. So we can see like catastrophic risk across trying to run exponential linear materials economy on a finite planet. And then you add the ex exponential technologies to that. Right. The exponential technologies basically radically centralize and decentralize power at the same time. Mm -hmm. The decentralization of power looks like decentralized catastrophic capability. So right. the ability to build drone weapons, cyber weapons, bioweapons, AI weapons in basements, non-state actors having that, yeah. where you can't use UN style mutually assured destruction in the to hands stop of it. Everyone. Yeah. So the the catastrophe weapons for everyone world, the main solution to solve that is things like kind of the China model, which is ubiquitous surveillance to be able to prevent that. Centralization. Which yeah. looks like increased centralization using exponential tech that gets dystopic. So we can say that you have one attractor which is increasing catastrophes and mm -hmm. what it takes to be able to control that are control systems that are Im imposed central power control systems the that China create model. dystopias. Yeah. So we're looking for something that is neither catastrophe or dystopia, which would be a third attractor. And I think the thing that's interesting here is Obviously, underneath all those issues are patterns of human behavior empowered by technology. Right. And patterns of human behavior looks like both our governance systems and our incentive systems. Right. So the kind of crypto economic world is looking at the intersection of new incentive systems and new governance systems, mm -hmm. while also building fundamentally new infrastructure that mediates those. Right. And so what my hope is, is that this space understands the design criteria of a third attractor well right. so that they can actually work on making sure the systems they're developing meet those design criteria. Got it. So if I could say back to you what you said to me, it sounds like 
there's, there's one model, which is the China model, where you've got a centralized actor that's kind of clamping down on their society through surveillance and control. And then you've got another model, which is kind of where the West has traditionally been, where you've got existential technology that creates more risks, and you don't have, uh, you've got kind of like decentralization or not a good way of, uh, of managing that, and that system will collapse because you have those technologies in the hands of more and more people. And then those are the two attractors, and then the third attractor would be how do we get away from those first two attractors? Is that roughly? Yeah, the catastrophe model has both mistake theory and conflict theory versions. The right. conflict theory is catastrophes that somebody intends, which is right. the decentralized catastrophe weapons mediated by exponential tech. Uh -huh. The mistake theory is just increasing externalities, and right. that when your currency system that is mediating everything market-wise all has externalities built in. Exponential externalities create, you know, eventually cascading catastrophes. Right. So you get catastrophe on both mistake and conflict theory. You uh -huh. get dystopias both at the nation state level, but also at the um, Web2 uh, Metcalf company level, right? right? The, the Facebook, Google, Amazon issue is a similar issue because you have corporations that have more power than most nation states mm -hmm. that still don't have anything like participatory governance yeah. or jurisprudence. No, there's no consent of the governed. So yeah. ultimately, that's kind of a new feudal oligarchy. So yeah. whether you're talking about the exponential tech-empowered nation state like China or the exponential tech-empowered corporation, those right. are both basically exponential tech top-down organizations. OK. Got it. So what is our way out of the meta crisis? So obviously you've got to look at the generator functions of the meta crisis and mm. then be able to understand the design criteria to solve them if you want to solve it categorically. Because right. if you just looked at, let's say we sequester all of the CO2 and solve near-term climate change from anthropogenic CO2, mm -hmm. that doesn't deal with dead zones in the ocean from nitrogen, it doesn't deal with overfishing, and doesn't deal with biodiversity loss or any of the other environmental issues, you actually don't buy many years. Right. If you just deal with one particular kind of AI weapons issue, you don't deal with the other AI issues or bioweapons. So okay. if you don't deal with it kind of categorically, you really mm. can't deal with it in an increasing okay. uh, So point it's all or, all or nothing. Well, it's fundamental redesign. And I think the thing mm. that's worth pointing out is we had a fundamental redesign of our global system following World War II, which mm -hmm. was the Bretton World's Bretton IGO yeah. mutually assured destruction world, because it was the first time we had tech that could actually cause an existential risk. Right. Before the bomb, we just couldn't destroy everything. Right. And so m major empires always warred over power. This mm. was the first time that you had a war that nobody could win. And so you had to prevent what all of human history had all of human civilization history had had, which was war between right. the superpowers. And so that, that world, the kind of Bretton Woods world, mutually assured destruction works when you have two superpowers right. and one catastrophe weapon. Right. Or at least a G8, a small number of right. superpowers that can monitor each other. Okay. And where the catastrophe weapon is very hard to build. It takes nation state level capacities to build nukes. It doesn't take nation yeah. state level capacities to build bioweapons. Right. In fact, we're like five years out from tabletop CRISPR being ubiquitous on the current trajectory. Uh huh. So how do you create a force Nash equilibrium? How do you create the equivalent of mutually assured destruction right. when you have an undefinable number of non-state actors that are very yeah. hard to monitor? Right. So you can see that like that solution doesn't work anymore. Mm -hmm. Similarly, one of the other key aspects of that world was globalization and the global monetary system right. that said everybody could have more without taking each other's stuff because you're going to exponentially grow the economy, which right. also required exponentially growing the materials economy, mm -hmm. which also drove all the planetary boundaries, which are also right. catastrophic risks. Yeah. So we have to get to how do you make a system that doesn't require exponential growth of the monetary system mm -hmm. that internalizes externalities and closes loops on supply chains. Right. So this is where starting to think about fundamentally new economic systems and coordination systems gets very um, central and interesting. Right. Now I've read a little bit about game B, which is opting out of our current rivalrous games and into, into uh, something that would bring us towards that third attractor. Could you talk about what game B is and what the design criteria for it look like? 
Yeah, Game B is a term that um, I wasn't part of the initial Game B crew. Uh, yeah. Right after it kind of dissolved, I made friends with Jordan Hall and Jim Rutt and Brett mm -hmm. Weinstein and some of the people who were that was at Santa Fe Institute. And it was just the recognition that this system is self-terminating. Right. And what and there's a game theory underneath its self-termination. Yeah. So is there something that transcends game theory that doesn't self-terminate. And it was a general moniker for anything that met those criteria. And then there was a bunch of work on what those criteria must be. So right. you, have, you have the idea of what would a good system be if it was globally implemented, but mm -hmm. then you also have the enactment problem of what does it take to globally implement it? To boot, like, to, to to boot create, it. Yeah. If you start with less than everybody, right? Like, so one of the reasons why internalizing externalities is so hard, like even say yeah. a carbon tax, is mm -hmm. if everybody doesn't do it, then whoever does it is relatively disadvantaged yeah, to whoever does it. Yeah, the free rider so, problem, yeah. And so the global free rider problem ends up creating inability for nation states to coordinate on stopping arms races and tragedy of the commons issues. Yeah. So that issue, the multipolar trap, which is anybody does the thing that in the short term game theoretically wins, Yeah. Everyone else has to race to do that thing faster, which in, creates a system that long-term everybody loses. Yeah. This is one of the design constraints of a game B, is you actually have to be able to transcend multipolar traps categorically. Right. So you've got to be able to say, how do we make race to the top scenarios where you make something that doesn't lose in the short term, yeah. but that also doesn't self-terminate in the long term? Right. And so, you know, you mentioned that it's hard for nation states to coordinate around this problem. Um, what if we had a global coordination layer that was transparent and uncorruptible? And uh, what if what would you say to a room full of 500 people who could program that coordination layer? How, how, how can we bootload game B using that coordination layer? And if, in case it's not clear, to those who can't read between the lines, I'm talking about Ethereum uh, as a coordination mechanism, uh, substrate for humanity. I'll say why transparent is really important. Yeah. Is let's say you want to prevent a multipolar trap that is an arms race between superpowers that can actually possibly win the arms race. Right. So far, we almost exclusively fail at this, right? We didn't right. really achieve nuclear deproliferation. And at the time we tried to do nuclear deproliferation, there was still an arms race on hypersonics so that someone could win the first strikes. Right. Only on one vector <clears throat> and not on the other ones. And you got more countries that had nukes and then more countries that had alliances with countries that had nukes. Yeah. It gets even harder with preventing AI arms races or bio arms races because mm -hmm. let's say we make a UN mediated treaty yeah. and you're China and I'm the US or you're Russia or whatever. How do I know that you aren't defecting on the treaty in some right. secret deep underground military base? I right. have to assume that you are. So I either don't make the treaty or I make the treaty and I defect on it while lying to you about it and trying to spy. Right. And so we just don't have a way of getting out of that. The right. only way to be able to have the treaties work was if there was some trust that there was adequate transparency. Right. Because otherwise, the um, first mover advantage is so powerful in some of these areas that there will be the race for, for, for mm -hmm. first mover, which means that then there's an incentive to classify everything really effectively, right, to, for secrecy. Right. I was just talking to the head of cybersecurity for Sweden, and it's very interesting because Sweden right. doesn't have a black budget at all. Really? It, Everything that their military does is completely transparent and transparent to their own people so the people can actually democratically participate obviously means transparent to the US, Russia, China, and everyone else. Right. And he said their idea was everybody, Russia already knows, the US already knows, so rather than invest a bunch of resource in hiding it, let's invest the resource in just doing better. Okay. I don't believe that works if they aren't backed up by NATO that involves the US having a bunch of stuff in black projects that can win first mover advantage on arms races against Russia or China in that case. Right. And so what you have to make happen is if you want to be able to solve arms races, you have to be able to ensure that the various sides actually can monitor. So you either need transparency mm -hmm. or you need some kind of zero knowledge proof type phenomena right. where then they can make an agreement and trust that the agreement actually has the transparency needed for enforcement. Mm -hmm. Now, that means that you have to make the transparent system beat the non-transparent system. And I think there's right. a very real possibility because like in the US, the special compartmentalized information classification yeah. means that there's such shitty coordination between the departments that there's a huge yeah. amount of waste. Right. So if you could remove all of, if you could 
lose the benefits of classification, but mm -hmm. the benefits of transparency were more game theoretically beneficial for that in-group relative to the rivalrous out-group, then right. you would drive a race to the top on transparency rather than a race to the bottom on secrecy. Yeah. Then you would have the transparent basis to actually be able to solve multipolar traps. I see, okay. Um, so we would say that's, that would be an example of a design constraint for a third attractor right. is if you can make your transparent system categorically outcompete the non-transparent system, right. you're going to drive fun significant races to the top. But you have to, in, the same thing is, like, let's say you try to internalize an externality in your current system. Like you're going to yeah. try to internalize the cost of um, carbon in the environment. Right. The reason that we externalize it and just price the cost of coal or oil at the price of extraction plus a margin is because the more of the cost you externalize, the more profit you make. Right. The profit, the dollars, are basically optionality tokens that mean I have the maximum optionality for to be able to influence militaries or media or whatever I want. Right. Whoever maximizes the optionality tokens under rigorous competitive environments wins against those who don't. Yeah. And so there's no real competitively effective way to internalize those externalities. Right. Unless you bind a whole system that internalizes its externalities but also out innovates and you can't invest in the innovation thing without investing in the whole thing. Right. And the whole thing, even with the internalized externality, still outcompetes the other rivalry system, mm. then you can start to get somewhere. Wow, what a thread to pull. Um, we only have two more minutes. I just got the signal from the stage manager. So what didn't I ask you that you want to tell us and, and, and where should we leave the conversation? How do we continue the conversation? Well, you and I are going to do a deep version of this. What are the generator functions of the meta crisis and how do each of those generator functions mm. give a design constraint for a non-self-terminating system but that it also can bootload through rivalry? Right. And we'll take the time to unpack that. So if people are interested, great. Um, that's yep. on your podcast. Yep. So the Green Pill podcast that we just launched on the Bankless Network, we'll do a long form portion of this conversation with Daniel Schmachtenberger and uh, lay out how we can get out of the meta crisis. One thought I would share just in closing here is when you look at uh, Marvin Harris's model for thinking about civilizations, that any civilization you can think of as the infrastructure that mediates all the physical needs in relationship with the physical planet, the social structure that are the kind of collective agreements fields, basically governance and law, and then the superstructure, which is culture and the ordinating values. Right. You guys are, the crypto space is building new fundamental infrastructure and fundamentally new social structure simultaneously. The critical fucking thing is the culture the superstructure that is, what is the basis of the law that we use to bind the incentives? Because incentive alone will create multipolar traps and externalities. You also have to right. have binding dynamics. And ultimately, law for jurisprudence has to be bound in culture, or cultural values. So uh -huh. getting the cultural values right and having them informed by metacrisis. So it says, we can debate what a desirable civilization is, but we're all pretty much in agreement that at minimum it shouldn't self-terminate. Right. And so if we take the criteria not self-terminate as a beginning point and then make sure that those values are encoded in the social structure layer and make sure that the, the nature of the infrastructure insofar as that's influencing the right. social structure and the values is all moving in the right direction, that's a really, really critical piece. Amazing. Well, um, I look forward to being your bridge to the Ethereum space and to the Ethereum space back to you. Everyone give it up for Daniel Schmachtenberger. Thanks, Joe.